recording now. Yeah. All right, perfect. So welcome everyone to our uh, fourth talk of our data-driven methods uh, in engineering and science seminar hosted by the Kutz and uh, Brunton group. Uh, we're really excited to have uh, Yuan Bruna today, who is going to talk about prospects and challenges of machine learning in the physical world. Uh, Yuan is an associate professor at Kurao Institute at NYU in the Department of Computer Science. Uh, he completed his uh, PhD in 2013 at Ecole Polytechnique in uh, France, then uh, did a postdoc at Curran Institute at NYU. He worked at uh, Facebook AI Research in New York, and from 2015 to 2016, he was assistant professor of statistics at UC Berkeley and part of uh, Berkeley AI Research before uh, joining uh, the faculty at NYU in 2016. For his uh, research contributions, he has been awarded a Sloan Research Fellowship in 2018, an NSF Career Award in 2019, a Best Paper Award at ICMLA 2018, and the IAA Outstanding uh, Paper Award. Uh, today, Yuan uh, will talk about prospects and challenges uh, of uh, machine uh, learning in the physical world. Uh, world and um, during the talk uh, you can ask uh, questions in uh, the chat and you can raise your hand so we can unmute uh, you as soon as we open the floor uh, for questions all right so thank you very much uh, for being with us today and you can take it away Yuan. okay great uh, thank you Orban for a very nice introduction and uh, yeah welcome everyone uh, okay so today I will be talking about some of the work that I've been doing um, uh, alongside with my collaborators that I'm gonna be presenting along the way. And it's really trying to uh, bring a little bit of a perspective, mathematical perspective into this situation, right? The, the, the situation of deep learning today, where we are really facing an experimental revolution in the last, uh, let's say 10 years, right? Almost like a 10th anniversary of the AlexNet uh, next year. And so now, I mean, what started as a, you know, like a curiosity in computer vision and maybe, uh, you know, machine translation. Now, I think the reality is that it's really, uh, you know, integral part of computational science, right? We see uh, these methods now becoming more and more prevalent in many areas of science, uh, chemistry, biology, physics, etc. And so from a, let's say, from a mathematical modeling perspective, there's a, you know, first is, okay, what, what is happening here? What, what is the kind of a very concise description of what these methods are doing? And maybe we can agree that they are all, you know, they, they seem to have like some ability to extract in, interesting or useful information out of high, high dimensional data. And the techniques to do it, they differ from, let's say, the traditional way of thinking where the scientists would uh, already, uh, you know, uh, from first principles understand the features and then uh, maybe just learn very simple linear models on top. Here, there's a notion of representation learning, right, where good features are obtained directly from the data. And the learning algorithm is, you know, uh, relatively simple. So it's just uh, like, uh, you know, constantly adjusting the features until they, until they minimize certain energy, like based on gradient descent. And really all the physics or all the knowledge of the, the problem of the scientist is really like reduced to choosing the right architecture. And so, but still the situation, it's far from being perfect, right? It's not really like, a, you know, from a, from a scientist perspective, we, are, we should not be happy at this point, right? And the reasons, there are many reasons. Particular, uh, some reasons that I can, we can highlight is that these methods are insatiable, right? They are in incredibly uh, uh, happy to consume lots of data and lots of resources, and they're inscrutable, right? Very hard to understand what these things are learning, right? Um, so just to give you some, uh, you know, visual uh, eye candy about uh, what I mean by, you know, this insatiability, we really are in these trends where, you know, methods that these networks are requiring more and more compute power, like the data sets that people are manipulating are becoming to be like even more scary than they were, you know, a couple of years ago. A number of parameters is now almost like reaching at the trillions. I, I think uh, this like a recent projects from uh, Open and Microsoft. And so you can see that there's this trend. And, and, uh, and the other thing is that uh, we also see like a trend in, in which maybe different problems, different models, uh, so the different, different domains, they come with their own different architecture. And so we have all these like, uh, you know, uh, in this picture, like this zoo or like different animals, right? They represent different, different networks. And we don't really have, you know, maybe what we would like is to have some kind of guiding principle, something that we can use to think about all these architectures as 
you know, what do they have in common and what, what is their common mathematical structure that kind of explains all of these architectures and really helps us to maybe apply, you know, the re relevant architectures into a new physical problem that might have its own characteristics. So that's kind of the, 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 the pitch, like the kind of the, high, the kind of the North Star direction of uh, not just my talk, but in a sense, a, a research program. And so this talk is, of course, like a very humble way to tell you a little bit my perspective and where things are along this way. So there's a kind of a very rough, uh, the, you know, uh, very rough uh, program, like a separation between uh, first, maybe some understanding some uh, what we know in terms of uh, building mathematical models that involve you know, networks. Then we are going to talk a little bit about these uh, architectures that involve that really uh, uh, make extensive and fundamental use of the geometric structure and the inputs, what we call this geometric deep learning. And then, uh, uh, time permitting, we are going to, uh, I'm just going to illustrate very briefly a couple of applications in this synthetic machine learning. And I know that the, the audience here is might, might be much more tilted towards the last point, but uh, so I'm hoping to, you know, maybe uh, convey some interesting, some interest in the first two as well. All right. So just uh, before we talk a little bit about uh, uh, you know what we know about the mathematics of neural networks, maybe it's good to just uh, have like one slide where maybe I just uh, define the problem a little bit formally. Uh, and so here we we are really interested uh, thinking about the, the simplest machine learning setup, which is like supervised learning. And in fact, if, for most of the talk, you can just uh, restrict to regression. So in this problem, I have some uh, data distribution that is the input data that is drawn from some high dimensional space. And the labels are uh, drawn by, are given by some unknown function, F star, which is the target. It's the function I would like to regress. Okay, so this function could be, uh, you know, some physical quantity that you might be interested on, but also maybe some posterior probability of some class, given some input. Uh, then once we have the data, we are gonna try to fit this function, approximate this function F star, according to some function class, right? And this function class is typically parameterized by some architecture like neural net. And I think about uh, just for convenience, and that's actually something that is useful to drive the theory. Think about this architecture, this model class has been kind of organized into a different, basically you can assign a certain notion of complexity to each hypothesis. You can think about this as a norm. This Once we have this uh, model and the data, we can, have, we can define error metrics. Right, so that's the traditional thing. So it's just uh, just in terms of notation. So we can uh, we can we will mostly focus on the uh, mean, mean squared error uh, with respect to the data distribution and its empirical version, which is just the uh, empirical average, like basically just uh, replacing this expectation over the data by the empirical expectation over the observed samples. And so the base, most of the theory can be. You can do a lot of mileage by just focusing on a very simple learning algorithm, which is this empirical risk minimization, right? Which is a uh, uh, you know can be explained very easily as saying, okay, I want to find a hypothesis such that uh, its empirical loss is uh, small uh, using a small complexity, right? So that's the that's the that's the algorithm that's empirical risk minimization, and so uh, as a, almost like a foundational uh, you know uh, like the, the the kind of the foundational way of thinking about the statistical learning is really this decomposition of error, right? So basically what, what controls the performance of my estimator, right? So this is what is gonna determine how good is my estimator, how well am I learning my function? This error can be broken, can be thought of as containing three different sources of error. One term that contains the approximation part, which is how well is my space of functions like that I constructed, how, how adapted it is to approximate the target function. So I want to be able to approximate things with small norm. The other one that is a statistical error, that is the price that I pay by optimizing the wrong energy function, right? So this is the, it kind of penalizes the fluctuations between the population error and the training error. And lastly, the optimization error, like the, the price I pay for not being able to solve this empirical risk minimization, right? And so these three sorts of error, they are really like at the, at the heart of really understanding the challenge of learning in high dimension. Right, so we need to understand, in particular, as the space of functions becomes high dimensional, we need to be able to have a good control of all the species of error at the same time. Right, if we want to certify, we have a kind of a valid theory that we can learn certain classes of functions. Okay, um, so this is like, I mean, this is like 
totally standard, right? Just uh, putting it as the context for my talk. And so uh, for this, maybe we're gonna uh, focus on what is known or how, how does this, uh, you know, starting from uh, uh, neural networks, maybe start with the simplest family of neural net, which is a neural net that has a single hidden loop. So this is a hypothesis defines certain functions, right? Uh, the X is the input, theta, capital theta are the parameters of the neural net. And so my function, I can think it as an average or as a sum of very simple functions, what we call neurons. Okay, so each one of these thing, simple functions is just doing something very simple. It's just projecting the high dimensional uh, input to, to, a, to a 1D space, right? That's basically like the projection on a hyperplane and then passing it through a nonlinear function, right? That kind of, a, and this is called like a rich function. And so, um, oh. and so we know that these, uh, these class of functions, right? Has this, what we call this universal approximation property, right? In, in the sense that uh, even though this little function here, this little neuron is very simple, right? It's just uh, basically a 1D function that by, by at the, uh, stacking another of these functions together, I can uh, basically approximate any continuous function in the right topology, right? And these are really classical results from the 90s in approximation theory uh, developed by these kind of pioneers, right? Like Andrew Baron, Peter Bartlett, Petrushev, Zivenko, Hornick, et cetera. Of course, the question is, how, how is this thing going to help us in terms of the approximation of that, right? So what are the rates, right? So this result is very completely qualitative, right? It just says that with enough neurons, I can approximate anything, but we care about in, the, in, in terms of like understanding learnability of high dimensional functions is in precisely what is the rate? How many functions do we need to, to add in our dictionary to preserve a certain approximation? And for this, we can, uh, I mean, we are going to see that very, uh, very, very quickly, we are hit by what's called the course of dimensionality. The course of dimensionality. And for this, we can actually focus on just choose an example as an activation function that is this complex exponential, right? So this is a might be like a funny choice of activation function, but it gives us like a good grasp of what's happening, right? And the kind of the, the power or like the kind of the, the significance behind this universal approximation. So here, if I look at this activation function and I, and I go back to my single hidden neural network, I basically just realized that, that my approximation model it's just basically I'm approximating a function by a finite number of Fourier atoms. Okay, so I have a basically my approximation model is a truncated Fourier expansion. And now we know many things, right? We can leverage very powerful theory of harmonic analysis to understand when is the uh, truncated Fourier expansion in what at what rate it converges to the function, right? Like by basically what is the approximation error that I make by dropping a certain frequency. And as, as not, not surprisingly, everything will depend on the smoothness of the target function, right? And so what we see, I mean, this is again, super classic result is that the rates of approximation are gonna be bad, very bad, unless the function is extremely smooth, right? And S here corresponds to the kind of how many derivatives of my function are fine, okay? So this is what's called in more formal terms, like a solo left space of a, you know, a function that containing S integrable derivatives. And so the rate of approximation unless s is of the order of dimension, that's going to be cursed, right? In other words, that if I want to make, if I want to half the error, let's say if I want to reduce the error by a factor two, I will need to add two to the n more frequencies. Uh, there's a, of course, there, there's an alternative uh, for, of, this, of this class, right? That was uh, in fact studied by Andrew Baron, that is to consider functions that instead of penalizing, so this function basically penalize the number of derivatives. So you can, uh, you can construct functions, classes, where basically the, the underlying space is, a, is what, like L1 space, right? Something that depends not on the basically some uh, weighted L1, L2 norm of the Fourier transform by something that looks like a weighted L1 norm of the Fourier transform, right? That's, called, that's what's called like a Baron space. So in that case, you can actually uh, break the course of dimensionality, right? Because you can really see the, the, this quantity, like the absolute value of the Fourier of the transform of the function as some kind of like a measure, like a probability measure, right? So you can use basically Monte Carlo to get estimators here at the rate that is called the statistical rate. The problem of course is that, well, the question is, is what kind of, a, so how reasonable are these assumptions, right? Like either having many, a lot of smooth derivatives in my target or having this kind of integrability condition in my function, right? So are these, are these reasonable assumptions in the physical world? And so, here I'm just trying to motivate, like to, to try to illustrate why this might not be actually uh, a good prior for function that I care about in the physical world. So let's look at an example of you know a function that would map like a picture 
to basically the probability that there's a crab or like some object in the image. And so the, <clears throat> basically the, this function is not, uh, is, not, is not a function that you can easily approximate. Uh, basically you cannot assume that this function has a lot of derivatives with respect to the input, right? In the sense that if you use multi function, you lose the details, right? You cannot approximate the function by just throwing the high frequency information. And in fact, uh, this Baron condition, like the Baron space, is a, is a condition that is essentially equivalent to the ability of approximating my function with a sum of local terms, right? So here in this image would essentially correspond to breaking my input into, into local regions and then approximating my function as sums of local functions, localized functions. Basically like the function I learn is only, I can extract information at every patch and then sum the information on the top, right? That is something that would give me this Baron hypothesis, but we know that uh, many functions I care about, they depend on high order interactions, like long, long range interactions between different patches, different pixels. So this is not something that is well captured by those cases. Okay, so in that sense, this kind of low dimensional structure, like the, the basically the sort of regularity that I need to extract but then to approximate these kind of functions correctly is really not on the, on the high dimensional space, but it's really on the fact that these functions are really defined over low dimensional domains, right? Like here, for example, the, the input, it's not like a high dimensional vector, but it's itself an image over a two dimensional grid, right? And so that kind of motivates another class of functions, the classes that are what we call these geometric function classes. So what do I mean by a geometric function class? So this is a function that is, a, so I'm, I'm gonna make an assumption, right? That the function I wanna learn is gonna be a smooth, along certain known transformations of the input, right? And so these transformations of the input, they are really, I can, I can illustrate them, I can basically uh, exhibit them, thanks to the fact that this input space, right, the input space capital X, is itself a space of signals, right? And this omega, this domain omega, is a low dimensional one. It's in the sense that for us, you can think about this as a two dimensional. And so just to illustrate what I mean, think about like this, this video, right, of, uh, you know, people paintings, uh, like 500 years of female painting, right? That's a nice video from uh, Felix called Johnson. You can see that here, I'm defining deformorphisms that are defined over a two dimensional grid. And by applying, uh, by basically transforming the input with respect to the action of this deformorphism, I'm basically smoothly going into the manifold of faces, right? So, there's a, so this transformation is actually not changing the content of the signal too much, right? So this is a kind of example of a source of regularity that is really not captured by Sobolev and is really not captured by this Baron space. So where's the question is really, how can we leverage this prior? And maybe think about this a bit more general. Okay, and that really brings us to this like second point that is this notion of geometric. Okay, so the first uh, idea, or like the first way where we could maybe um, kind of articulate these geometric uh, priors is to think about symmetries. Okay, so symmetries have very this very nice and plain and neat algebraic structure in the sense that I, if I give you a symmetry, I can compose them, right? And I still have another symmetry, right? So they have this very nice group structure. Okay, so they form a group by composition. And here I illustrate that you think of like you have an image of a face and you can think about, uh, you know, acting, basically transforming this image according to a certain group, in that case, for example, like the rotations. And so every image, is uh, basically can be, you can think of, you can think about the input space as being organized according to these orbits, and so if I have now a, 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 an arbitrary hypothesis space f, and I promise you that the target function f is invariant, then it's very it's very natural that if I take uh, my large hypothesis space and I only restrict my attention to hypotheses that are themselves invariant, right? That's only, only, only going to be a subset of hypotheses, right? So I'm not. So basically, this is this has to be a good idea, because uh, because I promise you that the target is in that space and that space is smaller, right? So you have to learn inside within a space that is smaller. So you are certainly going to do better, right? So the question really is how much better? I mean, is this sufficient to break the course of dimensionality? Okay, so we, we all agree that using a invariant zero model should help. The question is how much does it help? And so here, uh, and this is work 
by uh, my postdoc, uh, Alberto Vietti, who is, by the way, in, in the job market this year, and uh, Luca Venturi, who is uh, uh, just finishing, uh, uh, graduated uh, this year. Okay, so here we are going to um, consider like a kind of a very natural, like a kind of weak assumption about the target function, but it's just a uh, Lipschitz. And we are going to now add this invariance point, right? We are going to assume that the function is Lipschitz and also invariant to a certain group. And so before we had these uh, just like weak hypothesis that my target function was Lipschitz. And now we are going to kind of combine the Lipschitzness with the invariance. And this essentially you can you can interpret this as asking that the function is Lipschitz with respect to a metric that is much weaker, right? That's kind of a semi-norm on the input space, right? So basically, this is basically looking at the distance, the Euclidean distance between two input points. This quantity here in the green is looking at the Euclidean distance between orbits, right? Like measuring distance between orbits. So of course, this hypothesis is strong. But uh, what we have, uh, uh, like basically the, the kind of the punchline of the result that we are uh, producing in this paper is that if I use this uh, information in the context of a kernel bridge regression, which is basically the natural space in which I can leverage like Sobolev and Lipschitz hypothesis, then I can, in, I can gain in, in generalization in the sense that I can uh, obtain gains in the sample complexity. And the gains, uh, like the amount of gain that I have is essentially proportional to the size of the group, right? So if I have an invariance group that is very, very large, for example, permutation invariance, then this quantity here will be very large, may, might be even exponential in dimension. But there's a problem, is that this gain is of a complexity is inside the rate that is cursed. Okay, so even if this uh, group was exponential in dimension, right, and exponential in D here, is going to be killed by this rate here. Which means that even if I use an invariance group, even if it was like a very large invariance group, right, like the group of, uh, let's say, local translations, which is indeed exponential in dimension, that by itself is not sufficient to break the curse. Okay? And, and basically, these, these gains are really tight, right, in the sense that we have a, a minimax bound with matching forms. Okay? And so if the invariance is not sufficient, we need to complement it with something else. Right? There's another prior in this story that has to be there to explain why we can learn these functions in high dimensions. And so what is this prior? What is the other prior? And so these are the prior in that is, there's nothing new here, right? Because if you look at the uh, you know, like very famous uh, people in the field like Yoshio Benjo or Yan Le Kun, when they explain why deep learning works, they also have this, they, they have this picture in mind that there's this notion of compositionality, right? Or this idea that you can actually break like the input that is a very high dimensional space into kind of localized regions and then extract features at every, at every level of the earth, right? And somehow that is that what the, the intuitive, at least at the intuitive level is able to break the cards of dimensionality. And in that sense, that's the right intuition, right? Because as we saw, just by arguing in terms of symmetries, we are not gonna be able to break the cards of dimensionality. And so something a, bit, a little bit more kind of connected with uh, like something that towards formalizing this intuition that Joshua and Yana are, are talking about is really to think in terms of scale, right? Like the, the idea that, uh, you know, that we can understand in a very complicated process that comes in the physical world, that I can maybe understand it and analyze it uh, efficiently by breaking it into different levels of scale, right? And so here we have it, you know, if you want to understand like how, you know, biology works, or if you want to understand you know, like the study of turbulence, percolation, there's all these phenomena and maybe Every one of you have its own favorite example where multi scale structure appears to be kind of the, the key, like organizing factor, right? Like the, by basically breaking the problem into different scales, you are able to maybe like provide an understanding that otherwise would be impossible. And so the question really is how do we combine this notion of like a, a compositionality or multi scale into the, previous, uh, into the previous kind of construction of geometric data? And so here we can just look at the, at the grid, and this is just a, you know, something that is a little, a little bit old, you know, that comes back to my PhD year, uh, years, uh, my work with uh, Stefan. And so really here, what we are saying is that we are gonna take the uh, thing that we learn in terms of like building symmetries and combine it with multi-scale. So how we do that 
is that we start with an, with an operator. So it's really like trying to understand the linear structure of the group. Okay, and so here we start with an operator that is linear and translation invariant. And so in the grid, the only operator that is linear and translation invariant is essentially the blur, like the, the, or like basically taking the average is the only operator that is linear and it's going to be invariant to translation, right? In the local version, just blur, right? So that's the, and so in fact, this operation here is not only invariant to translations, but it's also, as I say, like stable to these transformations that I basically described at the beginning that are really uh, capturing things that go more, much beyond the translation group, right? That is uh, like the notion of diffeomorphism that I described. And so this operator is stable to the transformations. So now, of course, this operator is losing a lot of information, right? I'm just keeping the low frequencies. And so very naturally, if I want to build a good representation, I need to complement that. And so how can I complement that? Well, I can complement it with an with a operator that instead of being invariant, it's going to be equivalent and still linear. And so we know that uh, by, uh, you know, by, by, by definition, uh, like a linear operator that, is equal, that commutes with translation is a convolution. Okay, so a convolution is by definition a filter. It's going to com commute with translations and it's going to be linear. So amongst those, we are going to be interested in not only those that commute with translations, but also those that are almost commuting with the formations, right? In the sense that as soon as we deviate a little bit from the translation group, the commutation property is not completely broken, right? It's something that is like basically preserved up to the, this, the form, what we call here the deformation test. And so this is where the multi-scale structure is. Because amongst those uh, 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 convolution operators, those that are stable to deformations are precisely those that break the information at the different scales. Okay, so, and one way to, to, to execute that is what we, we threw via a wavelet filter bank, right? So a wavelet filter bank is just generated by a single wave, like a model wavelet that is then rotated and dilated, right? As you rotate and dilate the model wavelet, you can basically extract information at different scales and orientations. And basically you can capture all the information on the input in a way that is stable to the formation, right? In the sense that if I look at the wavelet coefficients, and I deform the wavelet coefficients by applying a deformorphism at every step band, I get very close to inverting the operation, right? By first deforming the input and then applying the wavelet commutation. And so we are going to see how, uh, and, and so of course, once we have kind of a good control of the linear structure, we are going to, of course, consider uh, element-wise nonlinear activation function, right? And the, and the fact that it's element-wise, as, as you might anticipate, is important because we preserve all the commutative properties, right? So if I, if I have an uh, operator that is element-wise, it commutes with any diffeomorphism, right? So, so now we have uh, these three building blocks, like this uh, A, W, and, uh, and a, uh, a, W, and rho, right? Which is the element of similarity. And we build what we call this a scattering representation. Okay, so the scattering representation is really this idea that we can assemble our representation by stacking, by only using operators that have certain stability properties, right? In that case, it's like stability to these diffeomorphisms, right? That are these geometric transformations. And so we start with uh, basically the low-pass filter, which is just something that I can obtain by composing a bunch of localized low-pass filters. And so as I said, this is losing information, right? That's this operator here. So the information that is lost by the low-pass filter, I complete it, I catch it with the band-pass filters, right? By the, the collection of all the wavelet filter packs. And here, I, if I want to extract again stable operators, I pass them through this element-wise activation function, and then I, I extract low-pass filter again, right, to get the stability to the formation. And every time I apply a low-pass filter, I lose information. And so every time I lose information, I, cap, I complement it with the next layer, right? And that's kind of illustrated in this picture here, right? So, so here I have thrown some information, so I complement, I recover the information that is lost by the wavelet filter bank, that then is kind of passed through the network, to extract new coefficients. And every time I do that, I get new layers of coefficients, right? And so because I'm only uh, manipulating operators that are stable, their composition is also stable. Okay, so you basically uh, can, can establish that this is the word, this is something that you can find in the Stefan's uh, paper at CPAM, that the overall representation satisfies this property that if I apply a, a diffeomorphism in the input, the coefficients are not going to be changed too much. Okay, and so uh, 
Score is a representation that has this nice property that has like this multi scale structure in its core. But uh, in a sense, it's, a, it's still like a, a little bit of a Pullman's version of a CNN. In the sense that every time I extract these uh, wavelet coefficients, right, I extract information at different scales and orientations, and then I don't connect them, I, can, I don't connect this information anymore. So, in other words, the, there's no modeling of the interactions between different scales and orientations, right? So, it's only uh, like it, it really has the structure of a tree rather than a kind of a connected graph. And so, this has like actually probably like it, it has limitations in approximation power. And so, uh, uh, and of course, a, a, a very uh, like kind of a very natural fix. Of course, very natural just to realize it in retrospect. But uh, that's kind of the vision of uh, Jan and also Fukushima uh, even before is really to kind of relax a little bit this constraint, uh, relax a little bit this tree architecture, and really instead uh, have a trainable architecture where I can uh, instead of a uh, you know here if, if this corresponds to my previous family of different wavelets. Okay, so in, in the case of CompNets, you can think about this as just being kind of a localized oriented filters. Then I can like basically define layers by learning linear combinations of these stable operators, right? So, so but in a sense, the, 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 um, the spirit is the same, right? Is I, I can, like the, the, you know, the scientist has a good control of a family of operators that are stable and local, right? So that they're really like connected with this multi-scale spirit. And then the network, it's just learning on top of that stable structure, right? So the learning, the learning is happening after we have extracted these stable operators, okay? And of course, this operation here is a very natural extent to legals, right? Like the notion of convolution, right? And this, uh, everything I said here for the translation group is also true for any group that is basically homogeneous, like the, for example, the, the group of rotations in this field. So if this is like, is this something a bit more general, right? That we can even go beyond. And when I say more general, is really interested in these applications where basically the data is living in domains, for example, like a very weak metric structure, right? So the feature that I receive might be points in some 3D space, like that might correspond to some measurements in a, in a molecule, or might be measurements that I do in a, you know, in a network or in a traffic network, or et cetera. Uh, or even more like close to geometric applications, I might have measurements that really have, uh, you know, like the form of these like variable mesh structures. Like I can, I can be measuring structures in a, in a completely variable uh, 3D thing, right? So every time I have a new input, the domain changes. Same here, right? So these are domains that are not fixed, like a grid, right? These are domains that every time I have a new input, I might have a different domain. And so here, we can really have the, we can really retrace the same kind of connected back to our principle, right? So we can read this information, the data that we have in these domains, we can embed it uh, in some form. So in the case of the graph, for example, we can embed it through the distance matrix. And this uh, embedding induces kind of symmetries, right? Like the, the you know, the, like this mapping from the graph to the distance matrix is not one-to-one, -one, right? And because it's not one-to-one, -one, it induces basically the symmetry, right? I need to basically caution out all the adjacency matrices that represent the same object. And these are precisely the permutation, right? Like that is acting on the adjacency matrix by conjugation, right? This is like applying the permutation matrix both over the rows and the columns. And the same way for the, for the, for the, for the mesh, right? The, you replace the permutation here by any different morphism. And so the same way that we define the formations in the case of the grid, here we have the same notion. Right, we can look at the two graphs, like two domains, and ass ass assign them a certain distance, right? Like how much we have to form one graph to the other. For example, one can take this uh, formulation that comes from uh, basically quadratic programming, like this is like this is the quadratic assignment problem that really tries to align the adjacency structure up to permutation, right? That's an example. And also for, for this kind of like shape correspondence, you have equivalent metrics. So really the question here is, can we follow the same principle, right? So can we uh, use the same philosophy that we build an interesting, like a powerful representation by first understanding the linear, uh, in, like basically the linear invariant and equivariant structure. And that is local so that we can also get this stability. So basically the question is, yeah, the, the point is that in these domains, we can do have that, right? And the, and, and the, the um, kind of one possible way out is to think that, okay, at the end of the day, this notion of like a low pass filter that we have in the grid is an instance of something much more general that can be defined in many domains. Uh, 
we have a diffusion operators. Right? The diffusion operators is an operator that is intrinsic, right? That can be defined in, in basically essentially any geometric domain. Like all, certainly you can define it on graphs. Certainly you can define it in manifolds. And basically this has to place the role of the low pass filter, right? It's kind of like a locally stable linear operator. And once I have a diffusion, uh, it's only one more step to define the equivalent of a high pass filter, kind of the equivalent of the wave pass. And here you can think it, you can think it in terms of the Laplacian operator, right? Like a, a, in a graph, the Laplacian operator is the operator that is basically extracting uh, you know, variations in my signals, the same way that wavelet extracts variations in my signals in images. And uh, in, the, in the case of a manifold, this has a name of a Laplace Beltrami operator, but it's really the same spirit, right? It's really measuring kind of the smoothness of a function by through this, uh, what's called the Dirichlet -like energy. But the point is that now we have, uh, we can really take this construction that we had before and kind of upgrade it into what we call a blueprint for geometric deep learning. That's uh, something that we coined in this uh, project together with uh, uh, Michael Bornstein, uh, Taco Coin, and Petra Belikovic. And so really the, the story is, is not, not, very, uh, not very new, right? So we have a family of generators that again, are linear operators that are local and are designed to be stable to a certain action of a, for, for, to a certain transformation that is specified at the rate domain. And you can really think about these operators as basically being a low pass operator that is a diffusion combined with a high pass operator that is a Laplace. And so when I have this family of operators, I can learn on top of that. I can learn intrinsically linear combinations of these operators at every level. Okay, so the parameters of the network are really kind of mixing coefficients that mix diffusion channels with Laplacian channels, okay? And it's important is that because the same thing, because I'm, I'm, I'm only learning linear combinations of stable and equivalent operators, all the kind of uh, algebraic and stability properties are preserved, right? Like the uh, equivariance, if I combine linear operators that are equivariant, their linear combination is also equivariant, and the same thing goes for stability. And so really, I mean, this is, you can really think about this as a blueprint, but of course it's that it's not completely, it doesn't prescribe completely the architecture, right? There's still a lot of trade-offs. For example, of course the trade-off is how do you choose this family, right? Uh, and there's always that this is an interesting trade-off between stability and approximation. Okay, so for, just to give you a hint of, you know, maybe a taste of why this problem is not completely straightforward, is that in the case of uh, uh, learning functions or some kind of domain that is uh, defined up to, up to permutations, approximation of permutation invariant function is impractical, right? That's not something that we are, comf we are not gonna be able, we are not, we are never gonna be in the position that we wanna have an architecture that is probably in, uh, universally approximator of only any symmetric, any asymmetric function, right? That's because, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's not easy to, it's not hard to see, that the universal approximation of these functions is equivalent to being able to solve graph isomorphism, right? which we know that it's not something computationally tractable. Of course, there's a, like this approximation, this capacity to have to capture, uh, like to approximate many functions, is sometimes in tension with the stability, right? The fact that if I have a, do a domain and I apply a small, basically I deviate a little bit from the kind of the rigid algebraic structure, then the representation hasn't, doesn't, shouldn't change too much, right? So this tension is really interesting and is driving a lot of interesting research still in the area. So just as a kind of, a, as a takeaway, like a kind of a, kind of a snapshot of, of what I'm trying to, to say here, right, is that this, like thinking in, thinking along this axis of stability versus a kind of approximation power, this is a kind of some sort of like a kind of a guiding principle as the thing I was telling before, that even though it cannot completely explain uh, all the design choices, it gives a little bit of a, some chart, right? It allows us to put all these architectures into a certain common, kind of a common perspective, right? Like, a, you know, like the, the different, the different sort of domains, right? Uh, these domains, they are all kind of organized in terms of a symmetry structure and a deformation structure, and they give rise to kind of classes of architectures that are, of course, uh, uh, some of them are, are uh, still very popular today. Of course, there's, there's, as I said, there, there's many questions that are still like, uh, in, in that in that respect pretty open uh, like the role of depth right I, I described here that uh, depth is a notion that uh, in presence of multi-scale structure can be combined can be connected with the notion of scale but uh, but this is not something that is completely formalized in the in our bits right so there's still a lot of interest here. all right uh, 
Okay, so now I'm gonna, I wanted to talk, talk, uh, tell you a little bit about uh, kind of the other, uh, like one of the one of the kind of important sources of error, right? That we that we had in the in the beginning, that in a sense is a, is a little bit separate from the architecture, but I think that is also uh, something that I think is uh, is interesting and uh, and you know focusing a lot of our current physics, right? And so we saw that the data structure, right, it was important. It's important to you know as a guiding principle to define good uh, good hypothesis spaces, right? Like uh, incorporating multi scale and symmetries. Is important, right? To 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 kind of to learn efficiently in high dimensions. What about the optimization? And so here, just to to you know to put ideas into some like simple setup. Uh, like uh, I remember, like uh, that I mostly interested in regression. So I have a kind of a I want to I want to approximate the target function with using with respect to some uh, measure, uh, with maybe with some regularization. And so if I think about this problem in the function space. I have, a, I have a function, a functional that is convex, right? Because uh, this is a norm and this is a kind of a, a complex function. Of course, the problems start when I try to parameterize this space of functions using a, a nonlinear parameterization. Okay, so for example, like a neural network. And this is where, when I try to express this loss functional in terms of the parameters, now I have this composition that, be, that creates all these kind of headaches, right? All these problems. So here is a, is a there's a problem. It's a function that is non-convex, and in fact, it has bad landscape, right? It's a non-convex function that can be kind of of the nasty type, right? It's not this category of non-convex functions that have no that have a kind of a strict subtle condition, right? So here you have bad local memory. And so uh, just to you know to to give a little bit of a like simple question, even if we restrict our attention to the simplest parameterization, right? like to the simplest neural networks that are just a single hidden layer, uh, what can we say in them? What, what kind of guarantees and what are the shortcomings that are uh, known right now in this, in this affair? Of course, our, our, these are important for applications, right? Uh, and so, and, and a theme that you might, have, uh, uh, you might have seen in the recent years to perhaps explain uh, uh, to overcome kind of this complication is this notion of over parameterization. Okay, so that this has, has been developed by many, many, many authors in the last years. And this idea of over parameterization goes as follows. Uh, it, it, when I express it in this notion, in this uh, example of a shallow neural network, is that, uh, as I said, I have a, I have a, I had this uh, model that was uh, in, that, in, that, in that case, I write, I'm writing it as an average of functions. And this average is parameterized by basically one parameter, one set of parameters for every neighbor. Okay, so this is what parameterizes my function. And so um, one thing that is uh, interesting is that if I now take this uh, parameterization of my function, right, I can think it as a, I can, I'm parameterizing the position of n particles, right? Every neuron I can think it as a particle. And so I'm, I am parameterizing a function in that space. So if one takes the Eulerian perspective, right, and just thinks about this uh, system in terms of the empirical measure, just tracking where is the position of the neurons at the any, any given point in time, then if you rewrite this function, uh, you, you recover kind of a linear dependency between this empirical measure and the function. And so because the loss was convex with respect to the function, now we recover something that looks like a nice from the mathematical side that you recover a structure that is convex. But of course, the, this is convex, but in a way that is a little bit uh, non-trivial because remember that still like the, 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 the dynamics of the system, they are naturally expressed, they are naturally like Rangian dynamics, right? Like these positions, these parameters in the neurons, they are moving, right? So the natural dynamics in the space of measure is a transport measure, right? It's a transport measure. It's a, what's called the Wasserstein measure, okay? And so, uh, but it, never, nonetheless, uh, this kind of work that was like uh, interestingly initiated by different groups at the same time, like for example, like the group of Andrea Montanari at Stanford, the group of Francis Back in India, and even like the group here at then at Run, with uh, led by Eric Van den Eyden and and Ron Rotskoff. So really, they 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 managed to recover a certain like positive guarantee, right? In the sense that when the width of the network goes to infinity, by understanding very well these dynamics with respect to this fast metric. We can actually inherit global convergent differences, right? So we can basically get recover something that is something that resembles like a well posed problem, right? Like an optimization problem that is guaranteed to converge to the global solution. 
Okay, but really this this back and forth is is in a sense delicate, right? Because uh, when we go to the learning domain, we are we have to manipulate like very complicated non-Euclidean dynamics, and we have to operate, of course, in very high dimension, infinite dimensional spaces. So natural question, right? Of course, is that can this thing ever translate into a guarantee that is quantitative, right? That is really the guarantee that the practitioner is interested in, right? Like, uh, you know, if I train my network with, uh, you know, 2000 neurons, what's going to happen? So the problem, like the bad news is, again, we are hit by the course of dimensionality, right? The, the number of neurons that I need, so, so just to illustrate this, 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 this point, is that if I think about like a initialization, like in the space of measures that would result in this global convergence, uh, you following the basis time distance, uh, basis time metric. Then, if I want to recover the same kind of convergence guarantee, essentially I need to grid the domain, right? I need to put one neuron. I need to, to make sure that uh, my empirical measure is very close to the to this uh, initialization measure, in the, in a sense that in a metric that is very strict, right? It's the infinite uh, dimension basis time. And so there's a, there's a cross of dimension. And so the question is whether this is like a limitation of the uh, of the proof, or is there something inherent, right? Is there, is there something inherently hard about training neural networks, even in the simple case of shallow neural nets? And this is work with uh, my student, I Min Jai Song, and uh, postdoc, uh, Ilya And so here, uh, uh, in fact, uh, it's more like the latter, right? Is that, uh, that, that this problem, like learning neural networks, is in a sense is, uh, is stated as a very general problem, and it contains inside hard problem, like in terms that are like competitionally hard, right? And so here, here's an example that kind of illustrates why this is the case, is that think about like a target function that looks like a very innocent function. It's a, it's a, it's a function that depends only on one dimensional projection of the data. And it passes the function through this cosine activation, right? And, and it, so basically the point is that if this frequency if the central frequency of this cosine is sufficiently large, let's say square root of dimension, then this problem, like if you can solve, if you can learn this function, you are basically breaking modern cryptography, right? In the sense that you can actually, uh, yeah, you are solving a problem that is kind of a, all like a like a you know well-known problem, like a problem that is believed widely believed to be uh, hard, which is called the shortest vector problem. And the kind of the illustrate the kind of the geometry of like the s, like the reason why this is the case. You can think about, you can look at these two point graphs, right? And you can see that uh, they look the same, uh, almost the same, right? So, so if you look at the at one of the, the the point graphs from the right direction at the right time, you can discover certain like periodic structure that is planted there. So basically, the point is that the, that you know the ability to discover this planted structure, in fact, is something that is out of scope. Like basically, it's 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 a, it's a problem that is fundamentally computational, like a periodic structure in the presence of noise is something that is fundamentally. Okay, and so uh, what, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, trying to get guarantees for learning neural networks really needs to have some assumptions on the target function, like regularity assumptions in the target function. In particular, the smoothest assumption of the activation function is really what something that allows us to actually get the learning guarantees in the case of shallow neural networks. Right, and this is a, a line of work that uh, kind of started uh, by this nice work by Sham Kakade, uh, by learning a kind of image generalized linear model. And the idea really is that, uh, you know, this complicated landscape that I showed in the first slide, right, where you had this like kind of pre like huge presence of local minima, if your target function is sufficiently smooth, then you can still get information, like you can still learn substantial information about the data, about the target function, by basically modifying this landscape, by basically blurring this landscape, right? And blurring this landscape has this kind of after effect of removing some of the complexity, of most of the complexity. Okay, so here, kind of the takeaway is that we really need to, you know, if we wanna, if we are more on the, on the kind of deriving guarantees side of things, we need to leverage the kind of the, the smoothness of the target function. Right. Otherwise, we are. We, the problem turns into an impossibly hard problem. All right. So I have. A, I think I have a, about a, you know five ten minutes left. I want to have also some time for questions. I would just want to maybe uh, conclude with, by just illustrating some of the kind of applications that I've been thinking about uh, of uh, this kind of geometric deep learning models in the context of scientific machine learning. Uh, I know that here the the audience is particularly expert in this area, so I'm hoping that. It's, 
you know, not to say things that are wrong or trivial. Um, so basically, I'm just going to talk about like two snippets, like a, like a, like basically just one snippet that uh, that uh, I find particularly interesting and uh, and um, yeah, interesting and somehow uh, showing that that sometimes these kind of structure models are useful. And so here, what I want to really just present is uh, how can we use this kind of structured uh, component representation, to, like these scattering networks, to build statistical models for complicated physical structure. Right, and so here I'm talking about physical structure that is complicated in the sense of, for example, like a turbulence fields that are kind of uh, driven by this very complicated nonlinear um, equation, the Navier-Stokes equation, maybe a phenomena that has this like uh, criticality, like uh, you know case transitions, for example, from the IG model, or problem that is really in Gaussian, for example, like the, the problem that emerges in trying to model this uh, weak lines in cosmology. And so here. Uh, one thing that is interesting, well, like a, like a question that we are for us was interesting, is how can we build uh, like statistical models for these data? Okay, and so a statistical models for these data might be useful. For example, if you want to learn, let's say, uh, you know, like data-driven models that would uh, have to integrate these fields, right? If you treat it as an inverse problem, as a prediction problem, having a statistical model of the data that you care about is important, right? It's something that you can use to improve the quality of your inverse problem. And so the, the like a very natural and appealing statistical model for this data, and of course, this is really not a new idea. It's an idea that essentially dates back to Boltzmann and Gibbs, is to think about uh, this data as being uh, on the Gibbs type, right? Like the, the density of the data is following a Gibbs distribution. And so the Gibbs distribution, you can think of it as uh, Basically, the, the density, or yeah, the density is kind of pro, uh, proportional, like the, the log of the density is proportional to a certain energy. And so, uh, um, again, a natural model for this is to say, well, if I have some uh, knowledge about the physical world, maybe I can just uh, learn linear commission. Basically, I can just learn an energy that is in the linear span of this sufficient statistics, right? And this is again a very, a very classical model in statistics. So, of course, because this phenomenon is non Gaussian, uh, this statistics here, they need to be a little bit, uh, you know, more sophisticated. And so um, here I'm just showing that the, in particular, just to demonstrate that this data is non-Gaussian, right? If you take uh, here sufficient statistics that are just, the, you know, the covariance of the data, right? So that would be kind of the best Gaussian model that approximates uh, this, this field. You can obviously see that the, all the physics are lost, right? And here you might cap capture kind of the average regularity, right? This, these models can can completely predict the power spectrum of the process, but nothing else, right? And so all the geometric structure is basically lost. But in fact, if we use it as, as, an, as, a, as a model, these uh, scattering uh, models that I described, which are kind of the Poorman version of a comp net, here you have a basically a representation that is very compact, right? It has a very small number of coefficients, right? This is basically just measuring interactions between scales, pairs of scales. You really recover something that is Although it's not perfect, right? So here, you here, but basically, what I'm showing is samples from the model, right? From this scape scattering model. So you recover something that, even though it's not perfect, right? Here you see like like all the eddies here are not totally well recovered, but it has like basically a, a you know a, along the different uh, structures here, you really have a good template for understanding kind of a you know interesting non-Gaussian physical phenomena. And this is something that in collaboration with a uh, uh, Brice Menard and his students we uh, applied in trying to discover, uh, you know, like uh, uh, improve uh, parameter estimation for this weak cosmology, weak sensing cosmology, right? And so here, what you can show is that uh, uh, by using this, uh, the scattering transform, we can really, uh, you know, get uh, quantitative improvements over both the power spectrum and the confnet, right? Like this is similar to, to the confnet, but really with a representation that is out of the box, you have a very small number of coefficients, and they are, of course, they are completely interpretable. And so I think that this is a, just an illustration that uh, for many areas of maybe computational physics, uh, in fact, uh, it's, it's also interesting to, rather than uh, you know, follow the trend of uh, having very, very, very large neural networks to solve your problem, there's also some interest in sometimes using the architecture that are precisely the opposite, right? like uh, trying to, to actually uh, keep the number of parameters small and possibly interpretable. And so just as a conclusion, so yeah, I want to have a uh, little time for some questions that there are, is something that I wanted to describe here is that 
you know, the physical structure uh, is really a, an important ingredient. If you want to make, you know, hope, if you want to hope to have to make any progress in understanding kind of the theoretical, uh, you know, the theoretical reasons why we can learn functions in high dimensions, right? Like the basically the the models that we have right now, where we explain learning, they are not really compatible with the physical structure. And so I think it's an important to it's, it's very important to incorporate it to improve basically to really reduce the gap between theory and experience. I think it's also clearly that uh, you know that the, this this perspective is sufficiently broad that we can uh, use it across many different kind of data domains, right? Like uh, you know this this language in terms of symmetries, in terms of scale, is something that we can use across different fields that have a lot of uh, interesting applications. But of course, there's still a lot of uh, challenges as well, right? Is that uh, um, uh, something that we don't have time to talk about, but I'm, I'm guess here in the audience, there must be like a lot of uh, experts and a lot of interesting opinions, is that uh, it's not so clear to me yet uh, what kind of, uh, if we are there in terms of uh, are these models sufficiently robust? Are these models sufficiently, uh, you know, have the sufficient guarantees so that we can integrate them into scientific, scientific computing? Maybe it's still, something not clear to me, right? Like what kind of robustness are missing in these models? And of course, I think that the, in terms of like a really understanding, like pushing the theory, I also think that uh, there's, still a, there's still a lot of progress, there's still a lot of progress to be made in trying to understand basically the kind of what are the functional spaces that are associated with these architectures and how do they differ from the functional spaces that are kind of more classic, right? That are typically defined in terms of kernels. So with that, I'll just thank you. Thanks my all my collaborators that have, have uh, you know uh, contributed uh, substantially to all the things I talked about today, uh, and thank you of course for for listening. Um, so uh, I'm happy to take some questions uh, if there are some. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for this super exciting uh, talk, Yuan. So uh, yeah, so the uh, the floor is open for a question. You can uh, either. Uh, post them in, uh, in the chat, uh, or you can also raise your hand so we can uh, unmute you. And uh, Zach, I think we also might have uh, some questions uh, in the YouTube uh, chat. So, okay, I see Alan has raised his hand. So let me unmute you. Hi, great talk. Um, I know there are a lot of uh, fluid dynamics people here, so I, I figured I should ask. Um, so the, the way I think this is typically viewed in the fluids field is uh, you sort of start with a system of particles, you have kinetics, and then you take moments um, and, and get these reduced equations like Navier-Stokes. Uh, and this, this seems to be quite similar to uh, sort of the process that you outlined in this talk where you sort of have a, a symmetry in the velocity space of your original phase space. And then you um, sort of uh, do this multi-scale um, moment taking to, to get a new set of equations. So I think I think sort of an interesting place would be um, there's a lot of scientific work these days for higher order moment models and also closure models uh, for both fluids, plasmas, and many other systems. Uh, so maybe you can just talk about that if you have any uh, thoughts. Yeah, I mean th this is I think a uh, uh... Uh, a very uh, let's say deep. I mean, yes, I think it's a very interesting connection, and certainly, yes. Yeah, so I, I've been myself uh, starting to work about uh, precisely this connection, right? Like how to how to uh, you know connect this idea of like multi-scale into problems like for example, like the like the closure problem in the context of uh, you know climate prediction models and the navier stokes equation. So I think that the, that indeed there is this uh, fundamental uh, kind of thing that links all these problems together, that the information that you care about, right, might have this kind of long, long range interaction. For example, like, like, you know, like detecting a cat in an image, obviously is a function that you really want to aggregate information across different scales. And the other characteristic feature is that this uh, aggregation is really nonlinear, right, in the sense that uh, if I just, uh, you know, throw the high frequencies and just do like a linear low pass filter, it's not going to be sufficient, right? The same way, uh, as in the case of a maybe, you know, correct me if, if the analogy is like too sloppy, 
But the same way that if you take, a, you know, like the navier stokes equation and you just want to, you know, like uh, obtain a dynamics for the low frequencies, this is not going to be close, right? You, you really need to keep uh, going back again to the original resolution to extract information that is, that is missing. And so I think, uh, I mean, it seems to me that the closure problem is uh, like, at least at a formal level, much harder to, to state than the kind of the classification of regression problem, because in the regression problem, you know, there's a kind of, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an objective function that is well-defined, right? In the case of a closure, we, you know, in many of these problems, it's not, it's not even clear that it exists. But I think certainly this, this idea that you really want to propagate information across scales, and these architectures are able to do so in a way that the, it's like a new way to, to propagate information across scales that is not linear. And, and you can do it by enforcing certain stability properties. So I think that, uh, I mean, it's a, for me, it's a fascinating bridge. And, and I think there's still like, a, yeah, I mean, there's still a lot of maybe mileage that we can do with these methods uh, in the context, as you were saying, like fluid dynamics or like, uh, you know, other like plasma physics also where, where you also have like this closure problem, et cetera. So, yeah, I, I think it's, a, it's interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting direction for sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, John has also a question. So let me unmute John. There we go. Uh, yeah. Oh, hello. Thank you. Yes. Um, so I wanted to ask what you thought about the benefits of restricting your search of the target function to an in, invariant or equivariant space. Um, because uh, you mentioned that smoothness is a factor um, that helps you optimize your search. And I was wondering if restricting, uh, of course, if you restrict it to an invariant space, then perhaps you have a smaller space of target functions to search over, but maybe perhaps, um, and also you, by, by that uh, logic, you also have maybe perhaps more parameter sharing. So that makes it easier, but about the smoothness of the space, uh, I'm not quite sure how that changes. Do you know if you can comment a bit on that? Yeah, um, yeah that's a good question. So, so I think that uh, to separate my answer, there's uh, so like on the need of the invariant and equivariant architectures, um, obviously, there are two levels of the answer. The first one is that in practice, equivariant architectures or invariant architectures, they have like much smaller number of parameters than if you had the equivalent model without any kind of symmetry, right? Like if you think about like a CNN, you can think of it as a particular case of a, of a MLP, like a fully connected network, but of course, the number of parameters is massively smaller. So. Our results that I presented here today that say that equivariance and, and invariance are not sufficient to break the curse of dimensionality, you really have to think more like at the, what we are interested in is what, uh, to separate things at the exponential scale, right? So you really wanna separate between sample complexity that is uh, exponential in dimension versus sample complexity that is polynomial in dimension. But of course the polynomial is important, but like the, these, these factors, right? For, for, you know, in practice, when the dimension is let's say a million, if it's like a d or d to d squared, it can make a huge difference, right? And so in practice, using invariance is certainly something that will gain, will, will have uh, important gains in some of context. Then on the question about the smoothness, right? Like uh, uh, obviously the smooth, I mean, the smoother the target function, the easier it is to learn, right? In the, and, and we know that, uh, we, know, we know about this fact for many years in low dimension, right? If you want to, you know, interpolate like a smooth function, well, you can just do it with a linear method, right? You just do like a spline and it works well. In high dimensions, the smoothness of the target function is a bit more of, of a hairy question, right? Because, um, so we have, uh, we know that kernel methods, right? Are, so, you know, uh, are really like the natural device to leverage smoothness in high dimensions, right? Like, a, you know, like a kernel is really going to really model the, the directions of regularity of the target function, right? And the, and the problem, and the, the whole kind of a question here, uh, like, is whether you can, uh, for a given problem, you can tell me beforehand exactly the right kind of smoothness properties of the target function, or whether this kind of smoothness structure needs to be learned from the data, right? And this is really the, the problem is, or like the, you know, the main kind of uh, the mathematical level, the main advantage of neural networks over kernels, right? The, the ability to adapt to do this feature representation that you can discover this uh, direction of regularity in the data. 
I don't know if that answered your question. Uh, maybe I got lost a little bit in the in the answering, but um, um, yeah. So so I think that um, that, that the, the two notions are are useful, and uh, and that of course that the smoothness function uh, in high dimensional problems is a uh, often like a, an assumption that is just too too strong, right? You you, you you cannot make this kind of assumptions for for you know like image classification problems, and for that matter. Many problems that arise in scientific computing. Perfect. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Oh, yeah. Sorry, unmute you. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, so, on the second part of my question, I, I guess perhaps to, uh, to make it a little more clear. It was that sometimes there are algorithms to perhaps um, take a neural network and restrict it in a way to uh, so that it only searches over a space of equivariant functions. Um, so if yeah. you're trying to right, so if you're trying to approximate something that you know is uh, equivariant under some the actions of some group uh, symmetry group. Um, then you can restrict it. But um, so the, the question was mainly about smoothness in those kinds of spaces, uh, whether it really is an advantage to search over those spaces or, um, or, or, or not. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, okay, so, so now I think you're, yeah, you're asking like something a bit more concrete. And the answer is yes. So, uh, so okay. actually uh, I can, if I can refer you to the paper we, so the, the paper we have with, um, is precisely leveraging this trade-off, right? Is that uh, so? So if you are a little bit familiar with um, problems, so if you are a little bit familiar with the uh, kind of harmonic analysis, you can really um, like the the question you're asking is very concrete. So if you think about harmonic analysis over data that is like kind of input data that is high dimensional, think about input data that is in the unit sphere, right? like, like the, your images have all unit norms. Then really the question is uh, like a function that is a target function that is smooth. I can essentially approximate it by low degree polynomials. The low degree polynomials that are harmonic are spherical harmonics, which are basically equivalent to projecting the function in the low frequencies, right? And by doing like kind of a, a projecting in the Fourier domain and just keeping the low frequencies. Yep. And so <laughs> now you are, you are, you combine this smoothness with uh, invariance. Instead of looking at all the spherical harmonics, which are polynomials that are harmonic and have a certain degree, now you need to look at, at the space of polynomials that have this degree and that they're also invariant to certain action of the group, right? So these invariant polynomials of a certain degree are a subset of the of the polynomials of, uh, of that degree. I so counting exactly the fraction of those is what gives you the gains. And this is exactly what we, what we do in this paper, right? So in this paper, we really uh, 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 quantify exactly how much you gain. And you are totally right that the smoothness of the target is a, it plays an important role, right? If you have a smoothness on the target, these methods are really adaptive, right? And, and this kind of a result here can really, you can really see the presence of smoothness, right? And this is something that in the context of kernels, we studied what's something called like the source condition. Uh, but, um, yeah, so, so basically if you look at this paper, you will probably get some information. Okay, thank you so much. That makes sense. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Maybe, Zach, if uh, there are any questions on the YouTube stream, we could uh, ask those. Sure. Um, none have popped up, um, but now that I've unmuted myself, uh, in this slide and a couple ones, I was just curious the in the um, crabs when you were doing the wavelet and the blurring. Um, yep. In your images, I was curious about there's some uh, uh, transformation compositions of the transformations that were gray boxes instead of having features. So uh, I figured that was there for a reason. I was curious about it. Talking about that, about this? Yes. Uh, so in the, the gray box right there in the center, uh, just curious why, why it's that way. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. So this is, uh, okay, so this is meant to uh, capture when you take a, when you do like a wavelet transform of an image, you are basically extracting the coarse scale, like the coarse uh, version, and then the details, right? Like the information that is uh, in the in the high resolution image that is not in the coarse resolution. And this is great because, uh, yeah, I guess it, my my script was really not not so great. But uh, you should really, I mean, all these coefficients, the details are all small, right? They are all like have zero min, 
and they, that's why you see it gray, right? Uh, and so, um, yeah, that's kind of the illustration. But but the yeah, idea okay. here that you, yeah. Cool. So those would be features ultimately that uh, might uh, make it sensitive to if you add those coefficients, uh, they won't change the model very much. Okay. So, so the point, well, okay. So maybe just now that I'm here, I can explain a bit better. Is that uh, your goal? Your goal is to produce from this input crop features that are have their desired properties. In particular, you want features that are stable and that they hopefully tell you whether there's a crop in the image or not. And so if you only use the these ones here, right, that's too bad, because that's not good enough because you don't know the details, right? So you wanna recover information that is lost along this pipeline. So the first point where you lose information is here, right? Like the, this information should somehow be processed. Of course, you cannot just output these coefficients here because these coefficients are very unstable, right? You can see that if you move the crop, these coefficients are all gonna move all over the place. So you need to process them using the same pipeline as before. Namely, you just apply this point-wise nonlinearity and then you compute the low frequencies again. But themselves, like this, every time you do a low frequency, you lose information, right? So you wanna keep computing these wavelet coefficients every time you apply a low bus filter. And so that's kind of the, that's the idea of this scattering crop. Gotcha, yeah, I think it's clear. I was just curious about that detail since uh, there's, uh, I'm not picking up anybody else's questions time right now. Um, so thank you very much. Um, if anybody has more questions or on the YouTube stream, uh, we can raise them. Uh, and uh, whenever everybody needs to go, uh, no problem. Yeah, I think we're already a bit uh, over time. Um, so thanks again for that really great talk, uh, Yuan. And uh, yeah, so we'll have a small break now with the seminar talks and we'll be back uh, after the new year then. So thanks again, uh, Yuan. Yeah, bye everyone. Thanks for inviting. Bye-bye, bye-bye.